Well, welcome. We are so excited for our second panel of the day. Uh, we are joined by four uh, elected officials who have really done amazing work this past legislative session to push through policies in their state that are related to our roadmap policies, but also going to be such a benefit for the children and families in their state. We're gonna be joined by Senator Claire Wilson from Washington, who has been a champion for childcare policies and the work that they have done in Washington this past legislative session is just truly remarkable. The state also has um, voted to expand its earned income tax credit and fund the earned income tax credit which is really gonna be important for um, its residents next year. We are also joined by Senator Christina Passione Zayas from Illinois. And she has been a champion for um, improving birth outcomes for moms, and especially reducing the huge disparities that we see by race and ethnicity. And in Illinois, they championed several different important initiatives this past year, and she's going to spotlight many of that, uh, that those um, initiatives. In particular, they expanded their home visiting programs, and um, they had a really big emphasis on group prenatal care. We're also joined by Senator Teresa Ruiz from New Jersey. And New Jersey this also did quite a bit this past year. And one of the things that it did was voted to expand Family Connects um, and offer it statewide. It, along with Connecticut and Oregon, are the only states that have done this. And it's really exciting to see that this is going to be a program that is going to um, identify the needs that families have right from the start. We're also joined by Representative Stephanie Hilferty from Louisiana. Louisiana is really a champion uh, of, in states with regard to its child care subsidies. And Representative Hilferty has been a huge supporter of early childhood. And this past year, she did a lot on improving um, uh, birth equity and health outcomes for women by voting to extend um, Medicaid coverage to 12 months postpartum. And hopefully that's gonna go through in the state. Anyway, I am so grateful that you have all taken time out of your very busy days to join us. And I know that folks are excited to hear from you. Um, and so I'd like to begin by just asking you to introduce yourselves just a bit. And I'd like to hear from you why it is that you think that the prenatal to three um, developmental period is so important. Why are you interested in focusing on um, maternal and child health and making sure that our children get off to a healthy start and thrive? Senator Wilson, would you like to begin? Thanks so much uh, for having me here today. It's just absolutely a pleasure and an honor. And I would say uh, my entire career uh, has been focused in that uh, realm as we think about return on investment. And, and I'll say that I started as a project director for WIC in a very rural community in Montana, and then uh, moved to working with 11 to 21 year old pregnant and parenting adolescents uh, where I taught parenting um, and no fifth grader should ever uh, be a parent. And so, you know, thinking about um, where it is and when it is we can make the greatest uh, impact, we know that it's um, early and with families. And so uh, that birth to three space um, is critically important. And I, you know, often say we're the only place in the world where you've got to do the wrong thing to get what you need to do it right. And if we actually were creating an equitable environment, uh, we would start from the very beginning and we wouldn't have the disproportionality that we do. Well, thank you for that. And Senator Passione Zayas, would you like to share with us why you are so committed to the um, early childhood development? Definitely. Um, thank you for having us. This is really great to bring um, not only uh, legislators together, but women legislators who are powerhouses in this particular work. Um, I, I'd have to say, you know, as a community organizer, I'm deeply rooted in the mantra that the revolution will not be televised because it's going to start with infants and toddlers. 
And that has really guided my work because essentially high quality early care and education, as well as the prenatal care that's necessary to set the foundation, that is a basic human right. And it is an opportunity for us to address systemic racism and other interlocking systems of oppression from the start so we can set up the human experience to be best out the gate. And so that's really what has motivated me to be able to translate my organizing skills to the state legislature and to bring communities along to the space and create um, additional seats at the table so that we're not on the menu. Can you introduce yourself a little bit more and tell us why you're so committed to this work? So I'm not sure did you, if you called on me because you were muted for a little bit. I'm sorry, I did. Senator Weiss, I would love to. Okay, hear good. I could so I could read live somehow. First of all, no, I just no. we're, I, we're I don't know any so there will be technical problems. I don't know any of these phenomenal uh women warriors here, but I am applauding you and I am loving you from the Great Garden State of New Jersey because the work that you are all doing is really um just advocating for truth and policy. It's advocating for common sense approaches. It's recognizing that uh, when we engage in sometimes uncomfortable conversations, the best outcomes uh, will, will come out. So uh, just repeating some of the same words, equity, uh, start, uh, start uh, changing the conversation to understand that as chair of the education committee, when I first came on, everyone really just talked about the ed space from a K through 12 initiative. And I really shifted the conversation to say, this is a conversation that's zero to 16. So it is from infancy to career until you are a well-rounded tax paying resident, our job is not done, right? And that begins in the womb. And so access to healthcare, access to, to you know, appropriate living, Living, access to employability, and the list can go on and on and on. As a first-generation college student, I know for a fact that, you know, you can go your, to your local store and buy a winning lottery ticket, and that will change the trajectory of your life. Or you can walk into a school setting that's going to give you the absolute resourced opportunity for, for you to fulfill your 100% God-given potential. And that's where policy is critically needed to be sure that that happens in an artificial way when it's not available inside of a household that's doing it on its own, not for lack of will or for lack of love, but just because there are other things that take precedence in that space. We know that access to high quality universal preschool is the greatest investment any institution can make. And still we have places where kindergarten is a half day option. And so common sense has really been stripped away from this conversation. And now I think keywords that probably many of us for the last decade or so, I'm dating myself. I know some of you are way younger than I am, but, but places of spaces where I was talking about when I was running for office have become great target points, universal preschool, access to, to uh, you know, childcare, et cetera, et cetera, are now becoming huge buzz points. So I think the turning point for this country is now, and there is a real great space for us to make inroads ahead to be sure that women and children are resourced. Well, thank you for that and your commitment to this work. Um, Representative Hilferty, we'd love to hear from you as well. Big notes, can y'all, oh, you. I'm muted, I apologize. Okay. No, I should be unmuted, right? Can you hear me? Mm. Try one more time. Let's see. I think that you are muted, and we will be working with you to make to to figure that out. My apologies, um, and I don't exactly know what's going on. Um, she's not. You're not muted. I'm not muted. Can you hear me? Oh, we okay. can hear you now. Thank you. Okay. Well, that's. I'll go on. Um, thank you so much. And what I was just saying is when I'm on these um, panels, I take notes because I think we all learn from each other and I've already started taking my notes and I'll be following up with y'all to get ideas and share ideas. So I actually came into this when I was elected. I was one of the first legislators to have a, um, one of the first female legislators, I should say, to have a baby during session. Um, my daughter was born, Claire Marie was born in May, 
during our spring legislative session. So I was thrown in the world into the world of um, uh, prenatal, maternal health, and early education in a hands-on, in-depth way. And I saw in those early years the difference, the, the way those children are sponges, they are absorbing everything around them and everything in their environment. And what that environment is, um, is so crucial, especially in those early ages. Now, what I think is interesting is in Louisiana, we have really tried to make the case that early education and workforce development are two sides of the same coin. And that is not just to say that, yes, if you put this child in early education for from zero to four in 18 years, they will become a productive member of the workforce. If you have a child in early education, you're allowing that parent to enter the workforce. So, so not only are you making that child's life better, but you're looking, you're changing the dynamic of that entire family, which I think is so impactful. So I came to it maybe out of personal experience, but my passion for this and my passion for seeing a a uh, brighter future for Louisiana's um, children and families is what's really, you know, kept me in this. Oh, wow. Well, thank you for sharing that. And I'd love for each of you now to share with us what some of your most proud accomplishments are from this last legislative session. We would have, yeah, I know you could talk about it pretty much all afternoon. Um, unfortunately, we don't have all of that time, but I am so excited to hear more about the things that you are really excited about that um, your state was able to accomplish this year. Um, Senator Wilson, we'll begin with you. Well, I am absolutely thrilled to talk about the Fair Start for Kids Act, which is really probably the biggest piece of landmark legislation and the greatest investments um, that we've ever made in the state of Washington and been working on it from the outside for almost 40 years. So to be able uh, to be the guide on the inside to make it come to fruition was absolutely fabulous. And really, there's a four-prong approach. One is stabilizing, expanding the industry. Second thing was making uh, child care more affordable. The third thing was making um, child care and early learning more accessible. And then the fourth thing was really strengthening the prevention and intervention services. So um, we made... Uh, great investments in increasing rates for providers, decreasing the co-pays for uh, families. We have invested in $400 million in stabilization grants, um, health care for providers. We increased um, our state-funded pre-K as well as early um, education and um, really uh, created some stable investments for our birth to three, uh, prenatal to three populations. So mental health consultation. Um, we also were able to do uh, complex needs, trauma-informed care, dual language rate increase, non-standard hours care, equity grants, I could go on and on. Um, and we were able to also pass a cap gains um, tax, which is going to be the revenue source um, for funding all of this work. And I'm going to stop because there are fabulous other things that folks are doing, but um, it is a game changer for the families across the state of Washington. That is for sure. I, we were trying to keep up uh, and document all of the work that was coming out of that state, and it was very difficult to do. It's so impressive, and we're looking forward to just watching that um, play out over time. Um, Senator Passione Zayas, could you share with us about what you're most excited about that happened in Illinois this past uh, year? Most definitely. Um, so I came into the legislature right before the lame duck session, which was essentially um, uh, an opportunity to operationalize the call to action that the Illinois Legislative Black Caucus made in response to the murder of George Floyd and taking our protest to progress. And so four pillars were established to really address systemic racism at the root in the areas of education, health, economic opportunity, um, as well as um, ooh, the, the fourth is escaping me right now. We'll get to that in a moment. But the point is, is that there was a specific health pillar and um, one of the bills, HB uh, 158, which is Public Act 102-4, is known as the Healthcare and Human, Human Services Reform Act. 
Um, that specifically had provisions in there that were responding to a report that came from our Illinois Department of Public Health on uh, maternal morbidity and mortality. And we know, and I'm just putting in the chat right now a link to that report, we know that the whole country has the highest rates of maternal mortality among, you know, um, more affluent or higher income countries. And we know that structural racism contributes to these particular outcomes as it relates to black mothers. Um, in many ways, we can see this uh, demonstrated in that it's four to six times higher that rate of mortality and morbidity than it is for any other particular group. And so this particular bill was looking to respond to the call to action that came out of that report. And that was to really address the fact that we need to have some structural changes. Um, so one of the things that we were able to put in there was a framework for Medicaid to be able to be utilized for covering doula services as well as home visiting, evidence-based home visiting programs. We also put a provision in there for our Department of um, Health Care and Family Services uh, to be able to uh, develop a credentialing system for doulas, as well as to consult with experts in the community about what that credentialing program would look like along with a whole um, rate pay, uh, uh, for payments. Um, the other piece that I really want to kind of underscore is that the, there was a particular um, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Illinois has been supporting the expansion of Centering Pregnancy, um, which is an evidence-based uh, nationally recognized model for group prenatal care in select uh, federally qualified um, healthcare centers across Illinois. And um, we know that this model includes a program in which um, pregnant women can receive routine prenatal care, child birthing classes, and group therapy and personalized health assessments. On top of that, a grant was um, administered uh, to expand this particular model over three years, really working with or community-based organizations on the ground who know the nuances of each of their community, the layers, the complexity, and come with a culturally responsive approach to supporting moms, um, particularly moms of color. And so there are about six organizations that are um, recipients of this particular grant to expand this model, um, as I said, in a way that is culturally um, competent and responsive uh, to linguistic diversity. The other piece I want to highlight um, uh, was particularly looking at the workforce. I know we've been talking about it with respect to, um, you know, families and being able to afford child care and high quality child care. Um, but I specifically introduced and, and carried a bill that would establish an early childhood higher education um, consortium. And what this consortium would do is basically have all public two and four year institutions enter into an agreement um, to coordinate efforts to remove the barriers for our incumbent workforce to be able to meet their educational goals, whether that be a credential, an associate's degree, a bachelor's degree, um, or a master's degree. Um, but we specifically prioritize the incumbent workforce because we know that they are the least paid and we also know that they often experience so many barriers with trying to complete a degree. And so this agreement is going to provide scholarships as well as um, student uh, loan relief and wraparound supports and navigators to get them into programs and through programs. And I was really pleased that we were able to allocate uh, $200 million of our ARPA funds towards this effort to stand up the consortium as well as to provide the, um, the scholarships and the debt relief for students. So those are some of the highlights of this past session that I was really proud of. Well, you have a lot to be proud of. It's a really impressive. And the focus that you put on health equity um, is something that I'm hoping that other states will really pay attention to because you're really a leader in that area. And I appreciate the work that you did there. Um, Senator Ruiz, I'd love to hear more about what you're proud of um, that New Jersey accomplished this past year, because it was also quite a bit. Yeah, it, it's, uh, I think it, we could talk for two hours on what uh, the Garden State did, but 
some of the things that we did kind of tied and, and around it, and then I'll focus us specifically on one bill at the end. So obviously we were in the midst of a pandemic, and one thing that we had to really like uh, do time on task quickly was that we turned, uh, teachers turned their living rooms into learning labs, and the mothers at homes and, and families at home to turn kitchen tables into the classroom environment. But everybody did this in a space without recognizing that not all families were resources that didn't have access to broadband, didn't have access to technology. And so I really led a huge charge in an advocacy platform to be sure that people understood that while you think this is an easy fix, when you do not have a computer or you could have three children at home just with one tablet, that things weren't going to be, you know, that, that the starting line yet again gets pushed further back for the families that I represent. And so within a time frame, even though it took longer than, than I would have liked, we connected all of our families. And today, uh, if, if in fact, and, and God willing, we will not have to do that, but if lights get turned out in a classroom, that that accessibility switch is turned on um, in, in households so that that child doesn't get left behind in that space. We added millions of dollars into the fund to continue to expand universal preschool, which I said, I will retire from the legislature if in fact we get to that point. And the governor said he had a 10 year plan. So I guess I'm on a decade trajectory to get everything I need to get done before before I leave my um, my space. But the, the greatest bill that I think got the most national attention was uh, a bill that was part of the maternal health care package here in the state. And quite frankly, when I wrote the bill, it didn't come from that lens. Like Stephanie, I'm the first woman in the entire history of the state of New Jersey to give birth in the Senate, which speaks volumes about the lack of women in the age demographic in, in representation. And so I, I have a partner at home. I, I speak the language. I advocate. I can call on, on friends and family for advice. My life completely changed when I had a nurse lactation specialist come and visit me after I gave birth to my daughter. And uh, you, we all know that newness, you're questioning everything to the point you question it so much, you're so engaged in the child's health that you lose sight of what's happening to yourself. And I, I was committed to nursing her as best as I could, but I was always wondering if I was giving her enough. And the nurse stripped her down, weighed her, then asked me to nurse her, and then uh, weighed her again and said, you did it. You just gave her a few ounces. And for women who nurse, a few ounces during those few early days is an extraordinary thing. And everything just changed for me. And I knew then that if in fact someone like myself, who I'm a huge advocate for myself and my family, if I needed that support system, what does it say to a single head of house? household who doesn't speak the language, who may not have the resources. And I wanted that experience to be the same for every single person. Now, New Jersey has a phenomenal Family Connects program, which has a nurse almost become part of the extended family, but it is only established for for women who are in a specific uh, economic rung, right? And, and so what we did was really scale this up. Moving forward, every single parent who brings a newborn home would have at least one visit, if not three, in the postnatal scenario to answer questions, to connect to resources, to check in on that parent and the mother because we lose sight of our own health care because we're so focused on the child. And, and while I did that, it clicked the day that the governor signed the bill when the woman to the left of me said, when my nurse came to visit me and took my blood pressure, I was immediately diagnosed with post uh, preeclampsia. And if it were not for that visit, I would not be here for my two children. And so just extraordinarily um, proud of that moment. But it's, I want to say this because it's, it's important to have women in office, because if it were not for this, for the, the experience that I had, that lent itself to writing this bill, all these great intended consequences would not have come out. I tried to squish it all in there. Yeah, I, I I think that what you said about having women um, who have had these experiences be able to represent others and advocate um, in our houses of you know in state legislatures is just so incredibly important. And um, the story that you shared is just um, it's really touching. And I'm so grateful that this is going to be a program that everyone's going to have access to in New Jersey. I remember being shocked. They let me take my children home with me. I thought someone's got to look at this whole thing. And again, I'm someone who 
of studies child development and knows quite a bit, but I was um, unprepared the way that most new moms are in such an important program. So thank you for doing that. Um, Representative Hilferty, I know that you have a lot to be proud of um, from this last legislative session and would love to hear um, about the work that you have been doing in your great state of Louisiana, which is my Certainly. Um, and to just follow up on what Senator Ruiz said, um, I had goosebumps at that story. I mean, I just think that is so true. And connecting families with these resources, and especially not in that necessarily in the hospital when the mother has a million things going on. So I think that's really interesting. Um, some of the things we did this past session, this is actually a fiscal session for us in Louisiana. Uh, so there was a limited bill count of general bills, uh, but we were able to get dedicated early education funding through our, our sports betting, which passed this year. Um, so a portion of the sports betting money going to the state will go to early education. Um, additionally, we passed a bill and it relates more towards getting adults um, scholarships or not scholarships, excuse me, a scholarship to get a uh, certification or an additional degree that puts them into a, a direct career path. What we said at that point was some of these adults are going to have a one or a two or a three year old in the home. And if if that child does not have somewhere to go, this adult cannot go. Um, and achieve that certificate to then get the job to become a welder or whatever the case may be. Um, so we're actually are starting a pilot program where early education centers near some of our community and technical college um, colleges will have spaces for those children. So while mom or dad's at school, the child is school in that slot. Um, so I think it's a nice tie and it shows the direct tie in for workforce development and early education. Um, one of my colleagues, uh, Representative Willard, passed um, midwifery and doula coverage through any insurance offered within the state. Um, and then one of my colleagues, uh, Representative Landry, and I both worked, it was her bill, and I was a co-sponsor early on, uh, to extend postpartum coverage uh, to 12 months. Um, we actually got this through the House with bipartisan support, um, which which was a really good thing. I mean, we had people from both sides speaking in support of this bill. Unfortunately, we weren't able to get it through the Senate. I've already talked to Representative Landry. She plans on bringing the bill again, and we certainly plan on um, trying to move that, that effort forward. Um, so those were a few of the things that we did during this past year. Well, it's obviously so impressive. And the idea of thinking of um, child care and workforce is two sides of the same coin and it's two generation strategy. I just, um, it's so important. So uh, thank you again for the great work. But you guys, this past year um, was has been unlike any other. And I would say this time last year, you were probably all wondering what your state budgets would even look like, um, whether you would have to scale back and so forth. Um, to what extent did COVID and the pandemic um, kind of allow you to, to accomplish your goals and what were the challenges that it um, kind of created for you? Um, Senator Ruiz, you talked about the challenges it created for families and the work that you did to try to address some of those challenges. Um, so maybe you could start to just extend on the extent to which the pandemic um, made it more difficult or actually facilitated the ability to really move forward with efforts to support families and children this year? So the, the one thing I will say, and I repeat this all the time, the pandemic gave power to my agenda, right? I, I, the, the things that we're talking about today, I, I, I've, been, I've been screaming about sometimes alone uh, 10 years ago, learning loss, accessibility to resources, uh, you know, equity in our school systems, implicit bias. I mean, all things that people were forced to reckon with during a pandemic. And so what really happened during this time frame was individuals who didn't think that it was important because it wasn't happening in their own respective backyards had a, a, a coming of, of, of truth, you know, and honesty that they were forced to, to deal with in the mirror. And so what I think it's offering us now is an opportunity to really effectuate change in an honest space. 
So we have two choices here. And this is this is not unique to New Jersey. This is something that the country has to reckon with. These are the truths. And we're going to roll up our sleeves and have uncomfortable conversations about who we really are and create policy. Or we're going to continue to do what we've usually done in the past. And I hope we're not losing sight of things because when things start getting better, folks want to just forget like it, it never really happened. And I, I you know, People laugh at me all the time because I coined this phrase, the Scooby-Doo syndrome. And anyone who ever watched that cartoon, the Scooby-Doo would take off, but he would stay running in the same place. And bureaucracy and policy is very much like that. You just keep doing the same thing over and over again in the same way. The pandemic has told us that learning loss is a real thing, that my black and brown students have been facing this since then, since I can remember that, that New Jersey is reported as, as the number one public school system in the country. But I know for a fact that that's not something that every single student can hang on a banner outside of their school building. That this country as a whole pretends to have said they're making investments in education. But we all know that's a lie. When I walk into a building in my district that was built under Abraham Lincoln's administration, we cannot pretend that we are truly making investments in children in women or in our education infrastructure, and I mean human capacity in that sense, when we in fact do not recognize that education is the greatest civil rights conversation that we should be having right now. And it is a constitutional right that every one of us has in this country, whether we were born here or not. And that if in fact we don't engage in that space in a real honest way, then we're going to lose an opportunity that I believe right now that we have with all the federal funds that we have in place to bridge the achievement gap once and for all. The phrase that the pandemic gave power to your agenda is really a, something that is very telling, that these are not necessarily new problems at all. It's exposed a lot of the problems that already existed, certainly exacerbated some, but um, thank you for sharing that. Senator Wilson, how has the pandemic played into the work that you've done in Washington and, and the state success there? First, I was just going to say, oh, man, with what you just said. So just saying, um, you know, this is a gender equity issue that's been brought to light as well. So um, as well as being an issue around, um, you know, racial equity and social justice, it's also an issue that we know the pandemic has hit. Um, women much harder, not only on the industry side, but also as females in the fields who have often left their jobs. Um, and I would say, um, number one, I always say I walk with privilege and I know that, and I will use that privilege in every single room, not to be a voice for others, but to create the space and get out of the way so we can make the changes that other people know that need to happen. I don't have the answers, but I do have a door. Um, and so I believe that, you know, economic recovery begins with the uh, investments that we made. And the other piece is I speak very clearly that childcare and these issues are no longer poverty programs. And we're still looking at them as if there's only a certain segment of our population that needs them. I will never forget that certain segment of the population. And we will always need to make sure we have equity and access but also it was an incredible opportunity to take um, what I would say is individuals of privilege who suddenly had an urgent crisis on their hands that they've never had before. They could always purchase what they needed. They always had the resource that they needed and suddenly were in a space where they couldn't buy a diaper. They couldn't buy a spot in care because it didn't happen to them and it wasn't there. And that all of a sudden school stopped and that people suddenly realized that school was the care setting for so many of our families and so many children. So it was a um, wonderful opportunity to take the privilege, but um, make sure the impact was on those furthest from um, opportunity. So um, that really uh, was a piece for me. Um, the other was that pandemic touched everyone. Um, and that um, because of the urgency, it was an opportunity um, to make movement in things that had been worked on perhaps before, but there was never a sense um, that it was now was the time. So now was the time and it was done all uh, virtually. Um, and I think, um, again, we had greater understanding and empathy 
and uh, that moved the state to action and also um, to knowing that we needed to figure out some revenue to keep this going. Yeah, I think that the, it really did just make it um, the, the prime time to take advantage of all of the things that we know need to happen. Um, Representative Hilferty, what about um, in your state, how did the pandemic play into uh, your goals and the efforts and the success or challenges that you faced this last yeah. year? Certainly, uh, there, myself, as well as a few colleagues, we've been beating the drum of the greater investment in early education and specifically towards opening more seats. So the way our state's early education is funded and this goes back several years to Melanie Bronfen and now um, Libby Sonia, who do amazing work in our state. Um, a lot of our funding is geared towards our in-need four-year-olds. So we have almost 100% participation for pre-K for our in-need four-year-olds. What that does, though, is it leaves less money for our zero to three-year-olds. So several legislators, as well as myself, have been focused on increasing that investment. I think what we did see during the pandemic, which did make it difficult, is that the Department of Education got substantial funding uh, federally for K through 12, as well as for early education. Now, this was limited funding and could not be used to increase seats. But some of that gets lost in translation when you're saying, hey, we have a, you know, $100 million ask for additional seats. And they're, they're looking at what you've just, you know, what the department has gotten for early education. So I think there were, there were challenges in communicating how that money could be spent that was coming federally, what it could be spent on, that it cannot be spent to expand seats in many cases. Um, and so that was a challenge we faced uh, because we are constantly looking to see how we can get more of Louisiana's children, especially zero to three, because many of our four-year-olds are served into early education slots. Um, so we've looked at creative ways, like I mentioned, with the community college program to try to expand seats in, in very targeted ways for that zero to three-year-old segment. Yeah, I think that all of the um, funds that have come from the federal government through both the CARES Act and the American Rescue Plan Act have been a challenge for states, um, a welcome challenge. But we're we're challenge very grateful. I don't I don't. <laughs> um, so I can really appreciate the um, care that you've been giving to try to figure out how to maximize those investments and yeah. and improve outcomes for infants and toddlers. Um, Senator Passione Zayas, what about you? Um, how has the pandemic shaped your work this past year um, in Illinois? Sure. When the pandemic hit, I was actually serving on the Illinois State Board of Education, and um, I was also on detail for the governor to create on the on demand webinars for all of the emergency child care providers that kept their doors open. They never shut down. And that kept me awake at night to make sure that we had very accessible, straightforward information that would help them understand what the safety protocol would be, but still attend to the, um, the uh, social emotional needs, the child development needs. Anyways, I say all of that so that when I was sit sitting at the State Board of Education and we're, we're trying to figure out what's happening, how are we going to respond, I really anchored my advocacy in the issue around deeper investments with infant early childhood mental health, because I knew that the toll would be tremendous for children during this period. And I carried that with me as I moved over to the Senate. And therefore, we did a lot of work to make sure that we expanded our infant early childhood mental health services, as well as our registry within that. I think the other piece that came um, to light it was a piece that Senator Ruiz spoke to in terms of access. And so we really worked um, deeply in terms of codifying telehealth for early intervention so that that could be a permanent choice should parents choose um, to be able to have access to these interventions as well as to extend um, early intervention to the three-year-old who turned three over the summer months. For us, that becomes a huge conundrum and they really struggle to make that connection into the school district. Um, of course, I'm looking to even expand it earlier. So I will be pushing on that. And then I think the, you know, the other piece that really um, 
drove me is around, again, the workforce, going back to the workforce, knowing that they literally kept us together during the pandemic. We would not have been able to function in any sector had people closed their doors in Illinois. And so on top of the restoration, as well as what we're working on our stabilization grants, um, we also offered hero pay. And that really gave me a lot of, because I was doing the webinars, because I was seeing how this was affecting them, I was able to then really push forward on the need to ensure that we stopped exploiting the labor of our early childhood workforce who are predominantly women, predominantly women of color, immigrants and refugees, and that this is an issue that is not only a gender equity issue, this is a racial equity issue, it is an economic equity issue, and we did not have any more excuses to not act. So that, you know, in many ways, I, I definitely resonate with what Senator Ruiz said in that this was the this was a do or die moment. No more excuses. Let's get the work done. Absolutely. Absolutely. And caring for the workforce, I the amount of burden that they've been under this past year and what they've done to keep our economy afloat has just been absolutely amazing and we have to do more to support them moving forward so that we can actually rebuild our economy as you said. Um, so I want to give each of you just a final word on what your goals are moving forward. You accomplished a lot um, this past year and I'd love to hear more about what is exciting you um, and your goals are for this next year and beyond. Uh, we'll start with Senator Wilson. Well, I think implementation is one of the most important things as we push things out because we were able to move from the federal poverty level to the state median income and um, increase accessibility for many families. And so those that have been on a cliff, so to speak, or have been pushed out of the system, we need to make sure we reach out and bring them back in and invite them back in because they're now eligible for that. Myself right now, the biggest issue for me is salary parity as we think about our systems. And that uh, interestingly enough, one to 2000 days is paid very differently than 2001 days and beyond. And I am not necessarily, nor am I saying we have to have a definition of basic ed in K-12, but we clearly need to value the work that our early care and education providers do and think about how it is that we don't create pathways to poverty, um, but we create pathways so that uh, individuals who care uh, for our youngest learners are um, also able to sleep at night and know that they can uh, live and dream uh, just like anyone else who makes a living wage job. So that is uh, my big piece of work. And I'll say um, across the states, it seems as if pre-K is always uh, the piece of um, of work that people look at when we think of salary parity, um, but I'm not willing to just slice off another group. Um, I really believe we need to look at that full continuum of care um, prior to kindergarten to think about what that looks like. So that's the next big piece of work for me. Well, thank you. And your commitment to the prenatal to three period is just so important um, and not forgetting um, all the all the work that we need to do to support our families before they even get into pre-K, much less into kindergarten. So thank you for that. Um, Senator Ruiz, uh, what do you have on your horizon? What are your goals uh, moving forward? So I, I would love to finally see a bill that I introduced uh, probably two years ago is to create the Department of Early Childhood so that there's a unique focus and lens so that the zero to uh, five space has its own kind of agenda and doesn't get mixed up in, in, in the traditional K through to 12 space. I would love to see that uh, come to fruition. And just more so that every, all of us here who know that we work in government, if you're ever trying to open up a child care center, it is not only at the Department of Education, it is with the Department of Community Affairs and the Department of Health. I mean, it's an extraordinary a uh, space that touches many levels of, of, of government. So I would love to see that there. I have a huge bill package to help address 
teacher shortages, which now is another hot topic issue, but bills that were drafted before the pandemics in specific areas as a, you know, ESL, English as Second Language, and in our special ed spaces. Uh, we know that every state here, we could all probably raise our hands that we have a shortage of bilingual teachers and special ed teachers across this entire country. But the focus for me outside of any actual policy is going to be accountability and making sure that there is a public lens on what's happening. By accountability, I mean, are we doing that checkpoint measure? Our students lost a year of, of testing, and that's critically important, not to test for purpose, but to test to see what the real picture is and how we're going to make sure that that child can succeed. And also to see where is this federal money going and are we pouring money and getting a return on that investment? Yeah, that focus on accountability is also a way to really focus on equity to make sure that our policies are reaching those who need them the most. So I, I really appreciate all the work that, that you have done and um, what you're going to be doing moving forward. Representative Hilferty, would you love to share with us what, or we'd love to hear from you about what you have on the horizon? What are your goals moving forward? Yeah, um, thank you. And thank you for including me. Um, it is truly an honor to be with a panel of um, such accomplished women legislators. Um, I think definitely there will be the um, movement to extend postpartum coverage that we saw this year. Um, we'll be bringing that back. We will be again looking to find funding sources to increase our number of seats for our zero to three-year-olds. Um, that has been a continued effort and I think we will will continue to do that. Um, and, and ironically, I got a text from one of our partners as I'm sitting here that Libby Sonier saying that Family Connects is, you know, we're looking to try to do some pilots with that. So it's just so nice to see these things come full circle. Um, but no, again, looking at our maternal health outcomes and, and specifically as we extend that postpartum coverage um, and expanding our number of zero to three-year-olds, we are so grateful for that federal infusion of dollars um, towards our early ed, and we just need to see how we can increase that state stateside investment. Yeah, that is, that's great to know that um, there's so much on the horizon coming and your commitment to it. I appreciate that. Um, Senator Passione Zayas, would you like to um, close us out with what it is that your goals are moving forward? Yes. Yeah. So three of them, um, one of them I've heard uh, my colleagues here say, and that is the compensation piece. Um, you know, we can't create these educational pathways without um, leveling up the compensation, um, because what's the point of getting a degree if you're not going to get any type of um, increase beyond a poverty wage? So I'm definitely um, looking to identify uh, how can we take what we did with the hero pay and actually um, make it a lot more meaningful as well as um, institute it within our infrastructure so that it has a dedicated revenue source. Um, and I know some of my colleagues may have been exploring and have actually uh, been talking about how we might use uh, sources such as cannabis revenue to think about that. I'm going to just plant that seed. Um, the other piece uh, that I'm looking to uh, advance is really to support and sustain our mixed delivery system. Um, our community-based providers are literally the anchors for our communities and are set up to wrap around an entire family multi-generationally. And in many ways, they took the largest hit during this pandemic. And so I think ways that we can ensure that they get a fair share of our early childhood block grant um, would definitely be uh, one of the areas that I, I'd look to support. And especially with looking at what this federal proposal um, is starting to put out there with ensuring that our states have strong mixed delivery systems. And then I think the last piece, um, our, our state had a funding commission that really looked at how are the ways that, you know, to uh, Senator Ruiz, how, how can we um, consolidate and centralize all of our pieces of the early childhood system that are fragmented, that are disparate, and, and put them into one space so it's a lot easier for families and communities to access um, and so there's there's some pieces that are moving on that angle um, administratively, and I look to support that legislatively. And within that, but we're starting with actually ground up work, and that's establishing regional hubs to actually make up for the fact that we lost a lot of children participating in our programs. And so we need to get them back on the rolls, but we need to do that 
with community, not for community. They need to lead that process and we need to support their capacity building to do that. And so I'll put in the chat, there's some resources that Illinois, I'd love to share with all the wonderful colleagues that are here that Illinois is using to kind of guide this particular work. Wow. Well, thank you to all four of you for the incredible work that you're doing for um, families and our littlest ones. And it's really impressive to see this bipartisan support for supporting this really important developmental period. Um, this is not something that is happening just in one state. It's not happening just within one party. It really is um, a testament to how um, the recognition that this uh, developmental period has now and your leadership in this area is so important. And I really appreciate, again, you joining us today. So thank you so much.